lesson is grace and works. And so as we, as we start thinking about this, we looked at, uh, if you remember those last lessons, those last three or four or five lessons uh, last semester dealt with some terms. So let's, let's review the terms. I'm going to put them up there for just a second, and let's talk about them. There was that whole page of the different terms that we had. So let's look at them. What is reconciliation? It really bringing together, what is biblical rec- reconciliation? Per- perfect God. Bring sinful man back to himself using his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, what is sin? That falling short is rebellion or defection from God's character or commands. Spiritual death is we come into the world spiritually dead. We don't understand the things of God. We're dead in, in, in sin. What is redemption? To, to purchase by paying a price. What is atonement? Now, in a biblical usage, atonement means covering, and it means to cover sin. When you use it in a theological term, it, they use it to theologically to mean payment. So that some people will say the atonement of Christ, and what they're meaning is the payment of Christ. But the word atonement, both Old Testament and New Testament, actually means covering. So we looked at that and talked about different things. What is expiation? Do what? So it's substitution. It's paying the penalty for somebody else. Jesus died for us. What is regeneration? It's the act by which God gives what? Spiritual life to the believer. That's being born again. That's become spiritually alive. What is justification? It's to be declared righteous. That's by faith. What is imputation? Because we had that tonight. That's to credit. When you believe in Jesus Christ, God credits his righteousness to you. So if I asked you, are you, everyone in this room who know Jesus Christ as Savior, are you perfectly righteous? What would the answer be? Yes. yes. Yeah. Imputed to your account. We're perfectly righteous. What is propitiation? A satisfactory payment. So what happens is the wages of sin is death. So Jesus Christ died in our place. And God is satisfied. He, Jesus, First John 2, 2, he is, the, he is the propitiation, the satisfactory payment, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. What is our position? What would we say that is? That's our what? Our identification. We come to this world, we're identified in Adam. When we trust in Jesus Christ, we're placed in Christ. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, we're now identified with Christ. Sanctification, we just, these were terms, the three terms, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is to be declared uh, righteous. Sanctification is to be what? What is that word? What? Set apart, and it's the Christian life as we're growing. And then glorification basically is when we come to be with Christ and our justification and our sanctification come together in glorification. So those are the terms that we talked about last in those last lessons just so that we would be able to put those together. So let's think about grace and works. Now, we're continuing on because all of those terms deal with what Jesus Christ has done for us. They all give us a different view, a different angle of what Jesus has done and uh, paid for our sins and given us eternal life and those kind of things by faith. So the, here's the, the next issue, and that is this. The key question, the key question of salvation is this. How is a person saved? By grace through faith or by works of righteousness. That's really what, uh, and I've got that in your book, is it, it, how do we deal with this? How, what is the issue when we think about salvation? Is it, is it works or is it faith? And we all know that it would, you know, if you've been in us any time, we know that salvation is not by works. It's faith alone in Christ alone. But that's really the issue. And it comes down to, is it by what we do, our works, or is it by what we receive, which is the gift? And we receive the gift by faith. And we already know that there are so many people out there that are so confused on the issue of salvation. One of the reasons I like this lesson or the, the lesson of dealing with you know grace and works and how that fits together is there's a lot of confusion. There are people who say grace, but they add works. Right at the end, I've got, <clears throat> I've got a little write-out. Uh, this is from a guy's book. I'm going to read it at the end. And this guy, in this last section, he says... I want to tell you how you can have salvation. And I'm going to read it to you. And then you tell me, is it clear? Is it by grace through faith or is it by works? What does the person say? And then what would you say? I got an email uh, two days ago from a, a lady that I don't know where she lives. I don't know what part of the world she lives in. But she goes to our website and watches the stuff. And she told me that uh, she had been watching Matthew. you know. And then she wrote me. Two days ago, and she said, I've been watching Matthew, but now I have this question. 
Because in the lesson, I basically said, as always, I said, make sure that you know you're going to be in the kingdom of God, and that is by faith in Christ. Well, she wrote me and said she didn't know whether she was going to be in the kingdom or not, and how can you know? And she didn't know if her faith was strong enough, and if she didn't know if she had done enough. So, of course, I wrote her back and told her something different. So here's a person that, 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 that a lot of people that you might say to them, what must a person do to have eternal life? And some people say, well, it's just by grace and everything. But when you get right down to it, they actually add works. And so we're going to talk more about that tonight. So let's talk about grace and works. And, and the question is, can grace and works go together? And what I mean is, can, do you have both of them at the same time? What's the answer? No, the answer is no. In fact, Romans 11, 11, 6 says, if it is by grace, and he's talking about the whole issue, if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. How many works do you have to have in order for it to be works and not grace? Just one, one thing. Just one thing. If I said you need to be willing to turn away from your sins, is that grace or works? That's works. I mean, so when we start thinking about this, that's really sort of the issue. We realize this. So what is grace? And so we define grace this way. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. That's what it really boils down to. That's what grace is, getting what you don't deserve. We always talk at, at uh, membership training, and I always bring this point up about two people. I say there's two guys, and one when he's 12 gets in a gang, kills somebody, and goes to prison. Another guy starts playing football and goes to college, and, he, and when he's in college, he trusts Christ, and he becomes a famous businessman, and he does all kind of good things, and then he dies, and he goes to heaven because he put his faith in Christ. And then this other guy that got in a gang and, and killed somebody, and then they're about to put him to death, and on the way to death row, a, a, a pastor talks to him, and he trusts in Christ as Savior, and then they put him to death. And I will sometimes raise the question, okay, which one of these deserve to go to heaven? And sometimes people say, well, not the first guy, but the second guy did because he, you know, he lived a good life and did a lot of it. Neither one of them deserved to go to heaven. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. None of us are good. They're, oh, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, the, so grace is unmerited favor. It's getting what you don't deserve. When we say it's by grace we have been saved, it is the grace of God that actually takes a fallen, sinful human being and fixes it so that we can have eternal life with him. That's grace of God. So let's talk about, uh, if you look down, and I've got a little, there's a little acronym, this G-R-A-C-E, and people sometimes put it this way, grace is God's riches at Christ expense. If you want to write that down, you can do that. God's riches at Christ's expense. And, and, you know, what we really say is this, that God gives us eternal life and all of the stuff, and it's based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. I think that if, if we really grasp it, Every morning when we wake up, we go, thank you for letting me live. Thank you for another day. Thank you for giving me eternal life. I know I don't deserve it. I, I thank, you for, thank you for using me. Thank you for giving me spiritual gifts. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for my friends. Thank you. I mean, we just thank him all the time, that whole idea of gratefulness and everything because of what he's done. And it's not because we earned it. It's not because we, we did anything. God did not look down at any of us and say, mm, they're so special and they're trying so hard and they deserve to be with me. Uh, we all like what? Sheep gone astray, each one our own way. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one that seeks after God. Listen, we weren't coming to God. He, he's coming after us. So, so great stuff. And let's, let's think about it. So it, the idea of grace and works, let's talk about works for just a second. What, let's define works. What are works? Works are doing something to obtain merit. That's what works are, doing something to obtain merit. Look at this. This is Romans 4, 4. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as what? As a favor, as a gift, but it is what is due. It's just the same story. You go to work, you might get paid once a month, you might get paid every two weeks or whatever, but here it is at the end of the month, and your boss comes out and says, I've, I've got a gift for you. And it's your paycheck. And, and you, you could say, well, thank you very much, but that's not what? That's not a gift. You, you actually work for that. And so when a person who works, the wage that he gets is not a favor. It's like, I like to give you a favor. Here's some money. No, that's not a favor. I earned that. When we talk about the difference between salvation and discipleship or salvation and rewards, salvation is a gift that costs us nothing and rewards are earned. And we'll talk more about that later. But notice, works is doing something to obtain favor. That's what it boils down to. So is salvation... Is it based on grace, unmerited favor, or is it based on something that we do? And, and I always 
think about it. When somebody says, well, you know, you, you do this or you should do this, you say, how much and for how long? How many works and for how long? What do you have to do? So when we think about it, we could never earn as top of that next page, I think. If, it, if your book, I don't know what the new books are like, if they all match or not, but uh, the, 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 the next question basically is, can we ever earn salvation? Can we earn salvation? What well, The answer is no, and why? Because first of all, we've all sinned and did not measure up to God's standard. Now, if you're going to be with God, God is righteous and perfect, and if you're going to spend eternity with Him, you've got to be what? Righteous and perfect, right? And since we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, we don't measure up your standards, so that won't work. And then what we find is that the wages of the payment of sin is what? Death. And so if we don't measure up, that means we've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death, what's supposed to happen to us? We're supposed to be separated. Most of you know that I thought before I, I trusted Christ when I was 19, I went to church once when I was 6 and once when I was 12. And I, can, I, I remember thinking, because I thought that if you did more good than bad, you could go to heaven. And so if you did good works, like 100 good works and 50 bad sins, you're going to make it because, it's, you know, you got that. Well, I didn't realize that. I wandered into a Bible study, and they said the wages of sin is, and I thought the wages of sin was good works. And they said death. And what I didn't understand, first of all, is that our righteousness is filthy rags and that one sin separates you from God. And that's why it's got to be grace, because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all the good works in the world, basically our righteousness is just filthy rags. And we can do nothing to earn our salvation. And you know what the truth is? Look at this. We have nothing to what? Well, nothing to offer. What are you going to offer him? You know, we're going to offer him a fallen life. We're going to offer him a sinful person. We're going to offer him one who's dead in trespasses and sins. We're going to offer him filthy rags. I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, when you think about it, you're saying, okay, I'm going to take all my good works and I'm putting them in this wheelbarrow and I'm rolling them up to God, you know. What do you think? And he goes, get those filthy rags out of here. I mean, that's what they are, right? Because our good works are nothing. So when we think about salvation, there's no way anything we can do to earn it. The lie of the devil, and I am guarantee you this, we can go out of this community, we can go downtown, we can go to different places, we can ask people this question, what do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? And many people will say, try to live a good life, do something good, uh, you know, try not to sin, go to church, get baptized, do those all kind of things. And what we don't realize is the lie of the devil is this, do good and God will love you. We already know that we can't do good and God already loves us. He so loved the world that he gave his son. And so the lie is that you do things. We, we've talked about this many, many times about the difference between true Christianity and religion. When people say, so you're religious, I say, well, I'm not religious at all. I say that religion is man trying to please God. That's what religion is. Religion is man trying to please God. And so man does something. And when you look throughout the world at the religions of the world, they all have one thing in common. There's this being, some, and they're doing something somehow to get to him in some way. Christianity is not man-pleasing God. It is God-pleasing God. It is God who so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And so salvation in Christianity is God doing it all. And religion is man trying to do something. And so we can never measure up. We have nothing to offer. And so religion is all of works, while salvation basically is all of grace. I want you to think about this. The Bible teaches, well, so salvation is by grace. We come to God on the basis of faith. Now, that's one thing I, I, I need to bring that out for just a second. The grace of God is that he's provided a way for us to have eternal life and that we come to God on the basis of faith. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith is being assured of something. When he says, if you believe in Jesus Christ, I give you eternal life, or you believe in Jesus Christ to gain eternal life, that's just promise. It, that's what faith is. Faith is we trust the promises of God. We trust what he says. So let's think about for just a second uh, th this idea that the Bible teaches that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works. It's what we see all the time, over and over and over again. I remember the first time I ever I heard somebody talk about how many times it talks about by faith in the New Testament and that you're saved by faith. And one time I actually sat down and I was going to count them. And I had already read that there were 98 places in the Gospel of John that says you're saved by faith. And so I, you know, I started counting them and I, I started to realize there were a lot. 
And ultimately, there's about 165 just places in the New Testament that say you're saved by faith. 165 places. There are more. I have a, a handout that... Uh, that we use like our Thursday morning guys, we've got this handout that it actually gives you places, all the places in the Bible that basically talk about salvation by faith. And there are just hundreds of them. Bob Wilkin has a book out, and it's called, what is it, The Hundred Verses? But it, it's, it, I can't remember, I, I bought it. And it takes every, it takes a hundred places in the Bible, especially, and, then, and takes you through every passage and takes you through each passage to show you that, that 100, at least a hundred places it says you're saved simply by faith. We know in the Gospel of John, it, here's something you could do sometimes just for fun, because uh, you could read three chapters of the Gospel of John uh, a day, and that, uh, you, could, um, you, know, could, you could get the book in a week, really, three times seven is 21, or you might just read a chapter a day, but what you could do is as you read a chapter a day, Mark every place you see that it says by faith. There are 98 times in there. And I mean, it's amazing uh, when you look at it. So when we think about it, the Bible teaches that salvation is by grace through faith and not works. So let's think about some verse. I've got Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 there. I think I've got the verse. Well, I don't have, let's, let's do this. Flip over to the verse just for a second. Turn over there. And, and you can stay there after we get there because we're going to come back to it in a minute. Look at Ephesians 2, and we're looking at verses 8 and 9. It's really one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It's one of my favorite verses. Everybody asks me, I've got some friends, that, I've got a guy that uh, he always asks me, what's my favorite verse? And the hard part is, it's wherever you're really studying at that time seems to end up being your favorite whatever. But I've always loved John 3.16, and I've always loved Ephesians 2.8.9. So look at Ephesians 2.8.9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, and it's not a result of work, so let no one should boast. Now, think about that. It says, by grace, that's the grace of God, getting what you don't deserve, you have been saved, saved from separation, through faith, that's, that's taking God at his word, and it's not of yourselves. You didn't do it. It is the gift of God, what salvation is the gift. And it's not a result of works. Just make sure you understand that faith and works are not the same. It's not a result of works so that you can't boast. You can't say, here's what I did. When, I, when you think about this, I've had people say, well, but you need to walk down an aisle and make a public profession. I've had people say that. I say, so, so you can always say that I was willing to walk down and make a public profession. I can boast. Somebody else wasn't willing to get up and walk down, but I was. So you, there's nothing. You can't do anything. It's all by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Uh, it, it's not of our works. It's a gift. Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness what we've done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. He makes it very clear. It is not by the result of works that we have done. It's not our good works. It's not what we did. It's, it's, it's his mercy. Grace and mercy, are tie, they tie together. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. We deserve to be separated from God. The mercy of God is we don't get separated. The grace of God is we have salvation and eternal life. So they, they go together. But God, the Ephesians says, by grace you're saved through faith. And Titus says, it's not by, by the results of work, but through his mercy he saves us. So the Bible says that salvation is a gift. And for many of us, for all, probably all of us in this room, we've heard this a lot. I mean, we know it. We say, yeah, we know that. If you go to Stillwater Bible Church, you've taught over and over again that salvation is a gift and it's by faith and it's not works. It's not what we do. You're saved and you're saved forever. And, and next, next lesson is going to talk more about security because there's so many people who will say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't know for sure if I'm going to heaven. First of all, they don't understand what they're believing and they don't understand the promise. Promise, but we'll talk more about that next time. But look at this. So uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, grace saved through faith. Titus, not by works of righteousness and we've done, but according to his mercy. And then Galatians 2, 16, which is sort of a long verse, but is an incredible verse. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ that we might be justified by the faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh could be justified. He actually says we're saved by faith and not work. We're justified by faith in Christ. Over and over, it says the same thing. We're saved by faith and not by works. It is not by works of righteousness what we've done. It is simply by the grace of God, grace through faith. So we never want to take it for granted. And so the Bible teaches this whole idea that salvation is by grace through faith and not by works. Now, if we, as we go through this, if you've got questions or comments or if you want to stop me, we can do that and talk about anything. This, to me, is 
this, we saw all those terms and we talked over and over again. But when we get to this lesson, and that's one reason I'm, I'm always glad that it's the first lesson in the second semester, is what about the whole issue of salvation? And is it grace or works? And how does it fit together? And so many people say grace, but they actually add works. I think it breaks my heart because when, when I read this to you in a little bit, you, you're going you're gonna to say, I, I can't believe he says this. Okay? You'll actually say, who wrote this book? And who's buying this book? And who's reading this and thinking this is right? So we'll be looking at it. And so the bottom line is that. So it is, it is, by, it is by grace we are saved through faith. And it's not of ourselves. By the way, I, I, we're going to look at it more in just a minute. Because stay at the Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Because we're going to look at verse 10 in just a second. So if we look at that, then here's the next question. Is where do works fit in then? Because the Bible talks about uh, work out your own salvation and run, walk worthy of the calling which you've been called and run the race with endurance and live for Christ and obey the Bible and, and be a godly man. And, you know, it talks all about all those things. So where do works fit in? Because people say, well, it talks about works all over the place. It sure does. It doesn't talk about works for salvation. It talks about works for the what? For the Christian life. And so where do works fit in? And look, Titus 3.8, it says, A believer should do good works because it's profitable. Stay where you are. I'm going to read Titus. Just stay there at Ephesians because we're going to come to that in just a second. But listen to this. This is Titus 3.8. It says, This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want to speak confidently so that those who have believed, those who have believed God, will be careful to engage in good deeds. Now, he didn't say you do good deeds to get saved. He says you've already saved, you've already believed. He says those who have believed will be careful to do good deeds. So it is important that every one of us in this room do good deeds, even though people say, well, if good deeds have nothing to do with salvation, then why do we do them? It goes on to say, because these are good and profitable for people. Good deeds are profitable. They do good. They help other people. One of the things that what we're called free grace, which means we believe that salvation is a gift by faith alone in Christ alone and not works. And when we say that, there are some people who say things like this. Oh, so you tell people they can live any way they want to and still go to heaven. I say, well, first of all, how you live has no bearing on your eternal salvation anyway. So we don't tell people they can live any way they want to and they can go to heaven. The only way a person can go to heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ. And they put their faith in him and they have eternal life. Now, how a person lives as a believer does make a difference. It doesn't make a difference for salvation. It makes a difference for what? For rewards. Because we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be rewarded for the things done. So why would we do good as a believer? He says, do good because it's profitable. It's good for other people. When we live out our faith, when we walk worthy of the calling, when we live righteously and godly in a fallen world, when we do those sort of things, it makes a difference. There's a second one I've got right here. It's Ephesians 2.10. It says, we are created and saved to do good works. Now, I want to show you the verse because I want to make sure you understand it. And there's, there's two aspects I want you to see. But, but notice verses 8 and 9, it's, it's talking about you. Watch. Paul is writing and he says, for by grace you... It's plural, but he's talking to the, to the people he's writing to. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's to get to God. Not as a result of words, so that no one would bless. And then if you notice, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. He goes from individual believers that they're saved by grace through faith to plural, which is the body of Christ, which is the church. We, the church, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. Who's supposed to do the good works? The believers, the church, the body of Christ. That's, that's the flow of the passage, by the way. And in which God goes on and it says, goes on and says, which God prepared before beforehand that we should walk in them. We as believers, we as the church, we as the body of Christ, because Paul makes it plural there and he makes it we, first person, putting us all together. For we are created and saved to do good works. He didn't say, for you are created. Because he said, you, by grace, you have been saved through faith. He's talking about the salvation, individual aspect. When he gets to verse 10, and says, for we, corporate, are created to sa and saved to do good works. So it's a really powerful thing. So let's talk about it for a second. We've seen that it's grace and works. 
Grace for salvation works basically are going to be for reward. It's, it's for profitable for others. That's what we're created to do as, as the body of Christ. So we've seen this contrast between grace and works and where works fit in and that salvation is a gift simply by faith. So then let's go to, and I'm going to, let me erase this while we're doing this. Let's go to the message, okay? If you've been at Stillwater Bible for any length of time, you've heard me on Sunday mornings or you've heard us in the 412. Which Brian teaches really well. You've heard us in other different places. We talk about what is the gospel, what is the message, and those kind of things. So let's talk about the gospel. And the gospel is the key. Why? And I've got really there's Why is the gospel so important? Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The word gospel, of course, means good news. We'll come back to that in a second. He says, I'm not ashamed of this message. For it, this message, is the power of God for salvation to who? To everyone who does what? Who believes. Now, the whole idea of the salvation is comes by what? By faith. Whoever believes. And then he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is writing, of course, he's writing to the Romans, and he knows that the message of salvation first went to the Jew. They're talking about Christ's message, the aspect of who he is and what he did, that kind of thing. First went to the Jew when he was on the earth. So Paul is saying, it goes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the message that brings salvation. That's why it's so powerful. Is It is the message that saves. That's why when we start talking about people, talking to people, and we're talking about what does a person have to do to have eternal life, we got to be clear, right? Because this is the most important message in the whole world. Because if a person does not understand the message and never puts their faith in Christ for eternal life, what could happen? They could be separated forever. I mean, we have the responsibility to get to tell people how they can have eternal life. And so we, we want to we wanna look at that. So let's look at the word God. It, it brings salvation to everyone who believes. That's what I, I love about it. it. It goes back to faith. Okay, then, so the word gospel. The word gospel means what? It means good news. It means good news. That's what it means. It's euangelion is a Greek word, and we get evangelon or evangelize from that. To evangelize, technically, we're bringing a good news message. One thing I've, I've thought about even in the last month or two, especially over Christmas time, we were thinking about the message of Jesus being born in Bethlehem and who he was, and not just talking about a little baby, but the Savior of the world. I think about what a good news message we have. Our world is falling apart, and all, so much bad stuff, and the the virus, everything, and 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 people, you know, are saying this, and and we say we got a message, which is what, good news. I love it when it says born this day, you know, you know, good news to all people, you know, born this day in the city of David is a savior, Christ the Lord, and and, and it's a good news message. So when we walk out these doors. We're not telling people something sad. We're not telling something bad. We're telling them good news. We're telling them how they can have an eternal relationship with the living God and be with him forever and ever and ever. And, of course, some people will say, well, what's it going to cost me? It's a gift. It costs you nothing. That's why I love it. Because we don't ask people to do something. We don't, ask, we don't say, take a test. If you pass this test, you're in. Be good. Do this one thing. Show up here and do this. No, it says, take a gift. That's why, you know, I think about birthdays, and we always laugh about it. But uh, what do you get on your birthday most of the time? Some of you. Most of us. We get what? Presents. And what do we do to get them? Absolutely nothing. Our mother did everything. She did it all. And, and, and we get the presents, Right? And, and people come up to you and say, happy birthday, I just got this for you. You don't say, oh, I got to get them a gift because they got me a gift. No, you don't say that. You say, well, thank you because it's my birthday, <laughs> right? Right? It's a gift. And a gift doesn't cost you what? Anything. You may not like the gift. But you may go, I'm taking this back. But anyway, you, but, you, but the bottom line is you didn't, you didn't do anything for it. Even getting born, you didn't do anything for it, and, and, and they give it to you. So when we talk about the good news message, we're telling people, we've got a message that you can have eternal life, and it's free. It's a gift. You can have it. And so when was the last time we told people? We actually act like people don't want to know. They've done all kinds of studies. And we all think that nobody wants to hear the message. But they've done all kinds of studies. They came up with 78% of unbelievers would be li willing to listen to, to our message. And we think nobody wants to listen. 
They may not agree with it, and they may not believe it, but they would be, at least they would listen to the message to what you have to say. So where do we find the gospel? And, and I want you to turn there. We find the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. So flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to look, basically, at verses, it, it's 1 through 8, but basically 3 and 4 is really the, the key area. And we call this the gospel message. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Now I make known to you the gospel. And then he starts in verse 3 and says, For I delivered to you, first importance was also received. And then he gives us the gospel message. So what we want to do is, for, for just a second, is let's talk about it. And I, I'm going to do something that's a little bit different. I'm going to give a l more detail than you really need. And then toward the very end, we'll come back and kind of bring some things down. But let's talk about the gospel. And the first thing on the gospel, part one of the gospel is this, okay? Here it is. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. If you notice 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, he says, For I delivered of you as first importance that I also received that. Here it is, part one. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So part one is this. We'll just put it this way. Christ died for our sins. And then it says according to the scripture. Now I want you to notice this. Christ died. Why did he die? Because the wages of sin is what? Death. And notice it's for what? Our sins. That's substitution. What substitution? Expiation. Yeah, so, see? so here is Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Now, what scripture? Because when this was written, there was hardly any New Testament, you know. This would have been written 58, 59, and, you know, the first book was 45. That was the book of James, and then uh, Paul wrote, you know, a little bit later, 47, 48. So, so there have not very many books. So when he says, for I delivered to you first importance to also receive that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, what Scriptures would he be talking about? We call it the what? The, the Old Testament Scripture. So where in the Old Testament did it talk about that the Messiah, the Christ, the Messiah would die for our sins? Well, it's found in Isaiah 53. So write that in there, Isaiah 53. Now, before we go further, you could say, J.B., how do you know it's Isaiah 53? How do you know it's Isaiah 53? I mean, out of all the Old Testament Scripture, and you say Isaiah 53. How do we know that? Well, the next thing is, it says, how do we know that? I want you to turn to Acts. And we'll come back, but turn to Acts chapter 8, okay? Acts chapter 8. And as you're turning there, we'll see it. Acts chapter 8, and we'll start, uh, let's see, I, go, I think I can go ahead and put that in. How do we know? Yeah, look at Acts chapter 8. Look at starting basically around uh, verse 32. Now, let me remind you of what's going on. There's a guy named Philip, and he's called an evangelist, and he goes a lot of places. And he get, This is very early in the church age, and, and God told him to go to this, this, this desert rose called Gaza. There's still a Gaza Strip today. He goes down to Gaza, and he stands there, and he sees a caravan coming by. And it is a guy there. He was an Ethiopian eunuch. He was an official uh, of, the, of, the, of Ethiopia of the queen named Candice. And he had been to Jerusalem to worship. Now, he's not worshiping Jesus. He's, not, he's, he's actually trying to be Jewish, but he doesn't know anything about the Messiah, the Savior. He doesn't know. He's coming back from Jerusalem, going back to Ethiopia. And it says he was sitting there and he was reading in the Bible Isaiah. So he had a copy of Scripture. So he had to be wealthy to have a copy of the Scripture. So he had a copy of the Scripture and he's reading Isaiah. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go join the chariot. Literally in the Greek it says, go stick yourself to the chariot. <laughs> and so he's there. So Philip ran up, ran up there and he heard Isaiah reading. And he said, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And in verse 31... The, the Ethiopian eunuch said, well, how can I unless somebody guides me? He said, I don't really understand what this passage is talking about, but how can I know it unless somebody helps me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now look at the passage. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was what? He was led, like, led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shears silent. He did not open his mouth. His humiliation, his judgment was taken away. The, the, who, what passage is that? Anybody know? That's Isaiah what? 
That's Isaiah 53. This is the passage that says, All we like sheep have gone astray, each one on one. Well, the Lord had laid on him in the iniquity of of all. This is the one that he bore his body, our, our sins, you know, and that he was crushed and bruised and wounded. And so he's read all this, and the eunuch turned to Philip and said, Who is this talking about? Who is this prophet talking about? Is Isaiah talking about himself or somebody else? Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture. He preached what? What does it say? Preached Jesus to him. So he's actually, uh, the scripture is Isaiah 53, and we see from that Acts 8 passage that he says, that's Jesus. So when it says that Christ died for our sins, Isaiah 53 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, that he died for us. That's what it talks about. So when we look at the, the, the gospel and the passage says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, it is Isaiah 53. That's a good one. And then what is the proof that he died? They buried him. Yeah. You know, sometimes well, I've asked this question in the past. and I, I said, what was the proof that he died? And they go, well, they buried him. You, know? <laughs> you don't bury live people. You bury dead people. And so the, what was the proof that he died is they buried him. Okay, so part one is Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Christ, the wage of sin is death, so he died for our sins, substitutes according to the Scripture. The Scripture is Isaiah 53. And the proof that he died was they buried him. We know they buried him because not only did they bury him, that they put a big rock over and they put guards there to keep, to keep it. Okay? Now, in the second part, of the gospel, which is this, part two, is that Christ rose on the third day according to the scripture. So let me give you part two. Part one, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Part two is Christ rose on the third day. And then what does it say? According to the what? Scripture. Now, let's talk about the gospel for just a second. You know what the gospel is? The death and the resurrection. I always just do something like that. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. The good news is Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the Scripture. So as we look at this part, then we, we say this. What Scripture? It's Psalm 1610. So write that down. And so we're going to write down Psalm 1610. Most of us have said, well, I've read Isaiah 53 before, but I wouldn't out of the blue pick up Psalm 1610. Psalm 1610 said that the Messiah would what? Rise from the grave. That the Messiah would not stay dead. That's what it really said. Because we already know that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. The Scripture is Isaiah 53, showing that the Messiah would die, and that the proof that he died was they buried him. Well, now it says Christ rose from the grave on the third day according to the Scripture. What Old Testament Scripture said the Messiah would rise from the grave? We said Psalm 1610. How do we know that one? How do we know uh, that, that, that that's right? Well, how do we know? Go to Acts chapter 2, and I want you to flip back a little bit. And as you're turning to Acts chapter 2, I want you to think about this is on the day of Pentecost. This is Peter standing up before all those people. If you remember, the Holy Spirit came. They began to speak in all different kind of languages. All the crowds came. Some people thought they were drunk. Peter stood up and said, we're not drunk. This is so, something sort of like uh, Joel talked about. And then he began to, to talk about the great truth uh, of, of Jesus. And starting about verse 22 and 23, it talks about Jesus, how he was delivered up. And God, in verse 24, raised him from the dead. Now, here's something I want you to know. If you go through the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is the beginning of the spread of the message of Jesus Christ for the first 30 years of the church. Every time Paul, Peter, Philip, Anytime somebody gets up and talks, the message is always the same. It always has the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ every time. Every time. Just look at it. Study the book yourself, and you'll see it. And so here's, here's Peter standing up. What does he say about Jesus? At the very beginning, he said, This man was delivered by the predetermined plan. You nailed him to the cross. You put him to death. Then the next verse says, but God raised him up again. Now, so Peter says that Christ died, but he rose again the third day. And we say, according to the scripture, is Psalm 1610. Well, I want you to look down a little bit. And if you see in verse 25, 
in 25 through 28, he, he is quoting. Guess where he's quoting? Psalm 16. And look at verse 27. It says, You will not abandon my soul to Hades. You will not allow your Holy One. The word Holy One there means Messiah. To undergo decay. That is Psalm 16.10. And if you go down a little further, he goes on to say that, verse 31, that David looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ and that he would neither be abandoned to Hades nor his flesh suffer decay. So Peter, on the day of Pentecost uses Psalm 16.10 to show that the Messiah would be raised from the dead. Philip used Isaiah 53 to show that the Messiah would die for our sins. So when Paul says, For I deliver to you a first importance which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, Isaiah 53. How do we know that? We know that from Philip, and the proof was that he was buried. And then Christ rose from the grave on the third day, according to the Scripture. How do we know that? Psalm 1610. That's what Peter used. And what was the proof that he rose? He was, do what? He appeared. He was seen. In fact, that's what the passage says in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to turn back to 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to see it one more time. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. He said, I deliver to you first importance, which I also received. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. And the proof was he was buried. And then notice it says, and he was raised on the third day according to Scripture. And that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve and over 500 people. And so... The proof that he rose, he was seen. Now, let me tell you something. This is our message. This is our gospel message. The gospel has two parts. What is it? Part one, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And what's part two? Resurrection. The death and the resurrection of Christ. Now, you can, you can make it simple. You can say the good news message is the death and resurrection of Christ. Or you can say the good news message is, first of all, Jesus died for our sins according to the Scripture, Isaiah 53. And the proof that he died was they buried him. And then he rose again on the third day according to the Scripture, Psalm 1610. And the proof was they saw him. You can go to all that detail. You can go whatever you want. But our message is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel message. Now, I'm not to this message right here doesn't tell you how to be saved. This is telling you what Jesus did. When he died on the cross, what did he do? Paid for all sin. When he rose from the grave, what did he do? Conquered death. He did that for every human being. Okay? So this message, this message has the power of God unto what? Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who does what? Believes. So we hadn't got to that part yet. Okay? So this is the message. You can't say, I believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. That doesn't save you. To say, I believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. He died and rose again for every human being. You're saved when you believe in him for eternal life. This is what he did. He paid for our sins and he conquered death. And so we, when we think about this, so it, the proof was he was seen. And so when we say, what is the response? What do we want people to do with the message that Jesus died for them, paid for the sins, and rose again? What do we want them to do? We want them to believe. We want them to believe in Jesus Christ for what? Eternal life. Now, let me, let me remind you of something. This is the message. The response is to what? To believe. And the offer is what? Eternal life. Now, you've got to understand that. Go back to John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever what, would believe in him would not perish, but have what? What's the offer? What is God offering us when we believe in Jesus Christ? Eternal life. How did he do it? He died and rose again, paying for sin, conquering death, and offering to us the gift of, and it comes by faith. That's, that. that's, that's how simple it is. That's how simple it is. I want you to look at something. Look at these. It's mentioned 154 times in the New Testament. It's by faith. But let's think about this one. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Gave him to what? Die and rise again. That whosoever would 
believe. Well, you wouldn't perish, but you'd have what? Eternal life. Romans 4, 5. To him who does not work, but believes in the name of justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as what? Righteousness. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be what? Saved. Ephesians 3, 9. Grace you're saved through faith. By grace you're saved through faith. Galatians 2, 16. We went over that one. Galatians 3, 26. We're sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, who hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. Romans 1, 16. I've got one of my favorite verses. Listen to this. Listen to this. Just write this one down. It's not up on the thing. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Listen to what this says. He says, Paul says, I found mercy from Jesus Christ so that Christ might show his perfect patience and that I would be an example of those who would believe in Christ for eternal life. Paul says, I'm the example of a person who would believe in Jesus for what? Eternal life. Now, a lot of people are confused. When you talk to people and say, what is salvation? They say forgiveness. No, for forgiveness is involved. But what is that? What do we, what do we need? We need life. Are we dead in trespasses and sins? Yes. We are dead and we owe God death and we're supposed to be separated. Jesus took care of it all and he said, when you believe in me, I give you what? Life. Eternal life. It is very confusing that so many people, when they start talking about how to have salvation, they don't say, believe in Christ for eternal life. They say all kind of weird things. Let's talk about this for just a second. Let me look at the clock. Yeah, we got time. We got time. You've seen me talk about this a, a number of times, especially if you've been in any of the other, some of the other classes that we've taught and things like that. But when we talk about the good news message, the gospel, it's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it comes simply by faith. But there are people what I call front load the gospel, or backload the gospel. And what I mean by that is front loading is they do, they say, works for salvation. They say, uh, walk down an aisle, make a public profession, give your life to Jesus, make him Lord of your life, get baptized. All of those are front loading. They're things that they, people say you must do in order to be saved. They're works. There's another thing which is called backloading the gospel, which actually says you can believe in Jesus Christ, but you must do good works to do what? Prove that you're saved or to make sure you stay saved or to show that you were ever saved. It's works on the back end. Both are wrong. One says you do good works to be saved. The other one says you do good, do good works to make sure you're saved or to prove you're saved. Both of those are wrong. And you can always ask this one point. How many works? How many works do I need to do to prove that, I, that I'm saved? How many works do I need to do to so-called get saved? Front-loading and back-loading. And it destroys people. There's never assurance. You can never have assurance of salvation unless you look only to Christ. If you look to anything other than Jesus Christ, you will never have assurance of your salvation. We're going to talk more about that next week. But, you know, it's amazing. How many people do you know that if you say to them, are you absolutely sure that you have eternal life? Many of them say, well, I hope I do. Well, I think I might. I, I hope I do. Well, I, I don't know for sure. Or if you say to them, if you were to die, do you think you'd go to heaven? Many people say, I hope so. Or I think I would. Uh, do, you don't know? Well, I, no. Can you know that you have eternal life? First John five thirteen. These things are written to, who, to you who what? Believe in the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Wow. Okay, now I'm going to read this to you. It's going to make you mad. I hate to say it, but it's going to make you mad. But anyway, this is from a book, and, and, and it's at, at, at the end, and he says, okay, how do people have salvation? How do, you, how, do you, how do you have salvation? How do we have salvation? Faith alone in Christ for what? Eternal life, okay? Here's what he says. Because of the death and resurrection of Christ, we have get, been given an opportunity to be forgiven and have peace with God. Now, he, said, he doesn't say anything about eternal life right there, okay? He says, it may not seem right that salvation is a free gift. Sound good, doesn't it? Okay. But the scriptures teach 
that God wants to show his riches. So he's commanding all people to repent, to turn away from their sinful self, humble themselves for salvation, surrendering their life to his lordship. Now, is that, is that uh, a free gift? What, what does he say you have to do? Turn away from your sinful ways, turn away from your sin, humble yourself, and surrender your life to Jesus. That's called what? Lordship, that, that's over here. Isn't this here? He just said salvation is a free gift, and he just added three things to it, right? Okay, and if, you're, if you've never understood salvation, and you read the first line that said salvation is a free gift, you might go, hot dog. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. I have to turn away from all my sin. I have to humble myself. I have to surrender my life. How do I know if I've surrendered my life? And how do I know if I've turned away from all my sins? What if there's some sins I don't even know I'm doing? That How do I know? First, you know what? You can't know. All right, let's go on. Is there anything stopping you from surrendering your life to Jesus right now? What, if, what would we say? Is there anything stopping you from believing in Jesus Christ for eternal life? He's got surrender in your life. Is that works or faith? That's works. If you understand your need for forgiveness and you're ready to begin a new relationship, we ask you to pray this and be honest about it. Resolve to turn away from your sin. Open your heart and invite him in. Ask him to take control. Okay, now, he's already said, ask him into your life and then let him take control. Then finally, if you just prayed sincerely this prayer. Now, you could have prayed the prayer, but it wasn't sincere. Uh, you know, you might could have just said it. And so you could say, well, how do I know I'm sincere enough? I mean, I thought I was sincere, but what if I wasn't sincere? What if I, what if I wasn't as sincere as I thought I was? If you just prayed this prayer sincerely and gave your life to Jesus, I thought salvation was a gift. He says, we want to congratulate you. If you really meant it, you need to take some important steps. How do you know if you really meant it or not? That's like people saying if you really believe. Is there any such thing as really believing? You either believe or don't believe. There's no, no such thing as really believing. It's the object of your faith. Let me say this one final thing. It's not how much faith you have. It's the object of your faith. I can have all the faith in the world in Buddha. I can say, oh, I really believe Buddha's going to save me, and I'm lost. No matter how sincere I am, it doesn't have much, how much faith I have because I've got it in the wrong object. But I can have faith as small as a grain of mustard seed in Jesus Christ for eternal life, and I am what? I'm saved forever. Wow, is this good stuff or what? Do you want to tell people, give your life to Jesus, walk down an aisle, surrender, turn away from sin, humble yourself, sincerely do this and really mean it, or do you want to tell them to put their faith in Christ for eternal life and they're saved forever? What do you, what's your message? What do you want to tell people? Aren't you tired of stuff like this? Let's be honest. Aren't you tired of this mess? No wonder people don't know if they're saved or not. No wonder people don't know what you have to do. I have to tell you this story. This is years ago. This is like 10, 15 years ago. A guy came into my office. I didn't even know him. He just walked in, knocked on the door, and said, Can I ask you a question? I said, Yeah. And he introduced himself. He sat down. He said, I've been to four other churches today. And I've asked this question. What must I do to have salvation? He said, I went to one church and they told me I needed to get baptized. I went to another church and they told me I needed to give up my sins and give my life to Jesus. He said, I went to another church and it told me that, that since I, I told him I had been divorced and since I had been divorced, I could not have salvation. He says, so I'm coming to you. What do you tell me? And you know what I told him? I told him if he put his faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life, he would be saved and saved forever. And I took him to some verses and showed him it wasn't his works, it wasn't his goodness, it wasn't his life, lifestyle. It was simply faith alone in Christ alone for eternal life. He trusted Christ as his Savior. Now, what's our message? What are you going to tell people? Is it grace or is it works? So let's be, let's be, we have to be very clear on the gospel and the message. Salvation is by grace. It is not by works. And so our verses that you, for memory for next time is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace you've been saved through faith, not yourselves to get to God. That will result of works as anyone may boast. So I think, is that probably, it's in your little book, isn't it? Is it in, does it have the verses there? Oh, yeah, and then there's 1 Corinthians. Now, this is a little longer, but it's so good, okay? So you, you can't not memorize the gospel message. And then the other one is Romans eleven six. If it's grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace.